morning, you may be seated for just a minute, if you would. As you notice, our pastor's not here this morning. Uh, Brooks, his little boy, uh, had COVID, so they're just isolating. The pastor and Chelsea are okay. They're doing fine. Talked with him yesterday. And so uh, I think they'll be back next week uh, once they get through their uh, isolation. As, uh, as my friend Tom here says, it's COVID jail. <laughs> you got to stay isolated for at least five to seven days, and they're going to do that just to make sure everybody's clear. And we're, uh, we want to pray for them and be thankful for them. Uh, let's take a moment now, if you would, this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you would. Now, Father, Lord, we just lift you up this morning, Father. We just praise your name. And, Lord, we just thank you for the great, great grace that you've given us, Father, and your mercy and your love that you've shown us, Father. Lord, we thank you that you have come to us and be among us today, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit be with us. And, Lord, may we feel it and may we respond to your spirit this morning, Father. And, Lord, this morning as we go forth in this, this morning, we ask you to bless the message and the messenger. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, let me just give you a couple of announcements since I'm up here, if you would. First of all, I'll remind you about Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we have prayer time here at the church. And uh, we come together as many that can be here. And we pray for you. We pray for this service. We pray for you. We pray for your friends. And so if you've got a prayer request, you just let us know. Let some of us know what that prayer request is. And we'll put you on the prayer list. We'll be praying for you on Wednesday nights. It's a great time. If you can join us, I'd like to see you be here on Wednesday nights. So uh, that's the main message that I got for you there. And then the second thing is, if you probably drove in the driveway this morning, you probably noticed some big pieces of uh, equipment sitting outside there, a dumpster and a, a big uh, storage area. Well, we have begun, finally, construction on our, uh, our sanctuary upstairs. And I know that I'm thankful for that. I hope you are. And by forward by faith that we've been working on uh, for over a year now, uh, our contractor has gotten started. He has done tearing out some of the walls already and taking up all the carpet out of the sanctuary. All that's gone. And, uh, so the front of the church is closed off. If you tried to go through that this morning, you noticed that you couldn't get through there. So the little drive-through won't be able to be used probably for a couple of months, I guess, uh, while all that construction is going on. So uh, just letting you know that in advance. But it's exciting to see that we're getting started and getting moved forward in that. And uh, In fact, uh, Ron and I are going to meet with the contractor tomorrow a little bit to make sure everything's going good. And, and uh, he's keeping us informed, so uh, just be thankful for that. Continue to pray. I also want to remind you that on the fifth Sunday, every fifth Sunday, we'll have one this month, uh, the offerings that we get on the fifth Sunday will go toward our Forward by Faith. So uh, that would be different than your normal, regular offering. Uh, so just uh, think about that, pray about that, and see what God leads you to do. So uh, it's exciting to see, and if you get a chance, you can walk by up there. Of course, not today, it's raining probably, but... You can kind of look in through one of the windows there, and you can kind of see all that's been torn out up there. And all the stage part where the preacher was and all that, that's all gone. And all those walls, all you see standing over there now is just the, the baptistry itself. <laughs> and they haven't torn that piece out yet. So it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, okay, for us this time, I'd like to have our ushers, if you would, to come forward. And uh, we'll take up our offering at this time. Place around here in a minute. Yeah, best we get that side. Hello, young man. Let's go. Brother Brian, would you lead us in prayer, please?
hear me? Good. I'm not too comfortable with the headset that Brady typically uses, so I prefer to not have that around my neck and my head. So we're going to go with the mic on the stand today. But um, again, I'm not Brady, as you know, and uh, I don't know if we have any visitors here today or not. But uh, my name is Chuck, Chuck Baker, and I'm a member here at Pleasant Grove, and I'm glad to, to be here. Uh, I just out of the corner of my eye, I see my grandchildren back there. I'm really glad that I attend church with my grandchildren and my family. And so we're just, uh, we're glad that we're part of this fellowship. <clears throat> um, Brady contacted me on Thursday uh, that <clears throat> and asked me if I would speak. And um, so obviously it was a very quick um, surprise uh, that uh, came about with Brooks and his testing positive for COVID. And I hope that you will uh, keep Brady, as <clears throat> Rick mentioned in your prayers, and Chelsea and the family. I do know of others, as I'm sure you do, uh, know that are uh, struggling, having tested positive I dare say that we probably all know someone <clears throat> who has tested positive in the past week or two. So keep them in your prayers. Um, <clears throat> like I said, if there's any visitors here this morning, I do, I do welcome you and thank you for being with us this morning. Um, I'm sure that <clears throat> probably most everyone is a little bit uh, uncertain about the weather today and maybe a little bit anxious about uh, getting home. Um, so I promise that we won't be too long this morning. Uh, but God has put a message on my heart that I um, hope today will be an encouragement and a blessing and in many respects maybe a reminder for us today. Um, thank you Caroline for and Ethan and Gabriella for leading the music this morning. I always appreciate um, the music and their leadership in that and just uh, leading us in worship every Sunday. So thank you. Um, I did love the, the old hymn, Love Lifted Me, which I'm sure there are many in here who uh, appreciated it and uh, were glad to sing that song. And, but there is a line in that song that really spoke to me this morning said, love lifted me, love lifted me. What does it say? When nothing else can help. When nothing else can help, love lifted me. And um, I would dare say that all of us today need help. And we live in a world today that needs help. I think we will um, talk about that. Uh, here in just a, miss, miss, uh, just a minute. I do um, just want to say about the message this morning, uh, again, that it's a reminder, uh, kind of, that our citizenship is not in this world. Uh, we are citizens of heaven, and the Bible tells us we're just passing through, just passing through. And so everything that we see around us today, um, we need not worry or be anxious about that we're just passing through and that we have help from our Heavenly Father, from our Savior, and the Holy Spirit who lives within us. So just keep that in mind today as we kind of go through. Um, this message, um, I'm going to share, uh, if you want to go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is uh, one of my favorite biblical, Old Testament biblical uh, personalities. And just there's so much to learn from the life of Daniel. Um, and the book of Daniel, of course, a great prophetic book, a great book of prophecy. But what I want to do today is take a little bit from Daniel's life 
and apply it to us today in the world that we live in in the country that we live in today. So, I think you would all agree that by all moral and spiritual measures that we're in a, in a we, we live in a nation today that's in crisis. I, I think everyone would agree with that. We're in decline, spiritually, morally, in almost every way. And this is something that has just not happened this past year, folks. So lest you think that this is something that has just happened, it's been going on for many, many years. In the past year, we've all witnessed how much has changed both in our country and in our world. I want to read uh, something from, or paraphrase something from the 1970s, a Christian philosopher named Francis Schaeffer. Some of you are familiar with Francis Schaeffer. And he told us that, and this is in the 70s, that someday we would wake up and find out that the America we once knew was gone. This was back in the 70s. My question is, is that day here? Some of you are familiar with Pastor Erwin Lutzer, who for many years, over 35 years, I believe, was the senior pastor at the Moody Church in Chicago. He's now pastor emeritus of Moody Church. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here?, he said, we have crossed an invisible line, and there are no signs that we are capable of turning back. Our Judeo-Christian heritage that gave us the freedoms we have enjoyed is for the most part gone. The cultural war we used to speak about appears to be over and we have lost. He goes on to say that never have we needed God's intervention so desperately. Never before have we felt so helpless in the face of massive national movements that we cannot stop. Does that sound familiar? Do you ever feel like that? The things going on, movements going on that we are powerless to stop. I don't know about you, but I feel that way. Now keep in mind, Lucha wrote that book several years ago. Again, <clears throat> bringing it forward, we can only imagine and maybe even long for some days that we were were a few years ago. That's how much I think we would all agree we've digressed as a culture. We see the destructions and the disintegration, really, of the very institutions that God has ordained. He's established marriage, family, the sanctity of life today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. In our Sunday school lesson today, we talked about in our class that since 1973, we've had over 60 million abortions. Wrap your mind around that. 60 million abortions. The Supreme Court has redefined legal marriage in our country to now include marriage between men, two men, two women. We now live in a country and a culture that has decided it's not okay to speak the name of Jesus. It's not okay to speak the name of Jesus in our culture, in most of our culture today. In the public square, we can't pray in Jesus' name. And seldom do you hear, ever hear anyone speak of sin outside the church. And even inside the church, in many churches today, sin is not mentioned. One of my favorite 
pastors and commentators as John MacArthur, he said the key to societal stability is reverence and respect for parents and their authority. Unfortunately, we now live in a society where families are being torn apart, resulting in a generation of young people who are angry, depressed, have no moral compass, and show little honor for their parents and respect for any type of authority. That's the nation, the culture we live in. Christians are being fired for taking a stand for Christ in the workplace. Many coaches have been fired for taking a stand for Christ in their schools. Small business owners are paying the price for standing firm on their biblical and, and spiritual convictions. And we all have heard the term cancel culture. It's become a wave across our country. Think about the impact of that. A vicious, vindictive, and hateful trend that is aimed at destroying, destroying people's lives and their livelihood because they don't agree with what you say or what you stand for. That's prevalent across this country. Now more than ever, Christians are paying, or we will pay, a huge price to serve God and to follow Christ. On top of all of that, we continue to live amid a worldwide pandemic that has created so much heartache, so much pain, so much fear, distrust, and disruption for families across our nation. Many of you have been impacted by that. With all these things that I've mentioned, I could mention many more, do you recognize the America perhaps we knew 10 years ago, five years ago, certainly 30 years ago? I mentioned Daniel <clears throat> as I started. Um, in the book of Daniel and the personality of the person of Daniel, because if I think about the culture that we live in today, who best to go back to to, to look at a, an example who lived in a culture maybe similar, very similar in many respects to what we live in today. And who would best provide the example on how to live in that culture? And I went back to Daniel and his life and how he lived in the culture that he found himself in. And how did Daniel respond in the face of adversity? How did Daniel respond in the face of uncertainty and, and really the pressures that the culture put on him to conform to the way that that culture said was the right way, the only way. How did Daniel respond to all that? Well, that's what we want to look at for just a moment this morning. Daniel lived in a hostile culture, hostile culture towards Christians, towards people of faith. And if you know anything about Daniel, and we'll look at a few verses in the book of Daniel, Daniel's early life was disrupted. Why? Because Daniel lived in Jerusalem. The Babylonians took control of Jerusalem and deported Daniel and many of the Jewish young men, teenagers at that time, to Babylon. The reason they did that was to integrate that, them, assimilate them in their culture, which was a very pagan culture, and really to brainwash them to become part of that culture. But shortly after Daniel and three of his friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego came, they were faced with a decision. And 
And most of you, I think maybe all of you remember that story. They were faced with a decision, and that decision was to eat the king's kingly food or to um, not eat the food because they knew by eating that food they would defile and be uh, God's command to not eat that food. They would be disobedient. So they had to face a choice as they came into this very pagan culture. In Daniel chapter 1, so when faced with this decision about whether to eat the food, it says in verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So again, Daniel had to make a choice. He was new to the area, so to speak. He was being pressured to do something that would be disobedient to God, and he knew it. And so he petitioned the official to be excused and for his friends to be excused. And it does say in verse 8 there, which I love, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food. What does that mean? Daniel was resolute. He was bold. He was courageous. In light of all the pressure that was being brought on him, he was bold and courageous. He stood firm on his faith. He didn't waver. Under intense pressure to conform to the norms of a secular society, Daniel and his friends took a stand. And what happened? Well, if you look at verses, and I'll start in verse 12, Daniel said to the official, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And then as you look at verses 20 and 21, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel and his friends took a stand. They honored God with the way that they lived and the choices they made. In spite of all the pressures of the culture that was pressing in on them, they didn't know if they would lose their life. They were... You know, they were deported. They weren't citizens of Babylon, of Babylon. They could have easily had lost their life, but they took a stand. And God prospered them according to his sovereignty. And, and, and we'll go through just for a minute and we'll point out a couple other things. Remember, there were other times when Daniel and his friends took a stand. So... I'll mention a couple of them that you're familiar with. In the face of overwhelming opposition and certain death, what did Daniel's three friends do when they were when they refused to fall and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set had set up? What did they do? Look at uh, Daniel chapter three. So. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego responded to the king's request 
this way. Starting in verse 16. It says, they replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If, you, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. It goes on to say that Nebuchadnezzar was furious, and he went on and put them in a fiery furnace. All of you are familiar with that story. They were placed in the fiery furnace, and God rescued them there because of his sovereign work in their lives and their faithfulness. Look at verses 28 and 30. After they were rescued, then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servant. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. What a witness, what a testimony these three men were to the king who could have taken very easily their life. And instead they turned in that into an opportunity to witness, to be a witness, to be faithful when all the pressure was on them to conform to what they were being pressured to do. I think everyone remembers the Daniel and the lions then. That story, Daniel's refusal to pray to the king in chapter 6. And at that time, the king was considering placing Daniel over the entire kingdom. Why? Because Daniel had such a, a personal integrity and trustworthiness. He lived his faith in the eyes of even the king, and the king trusted him. But Daniel's enemies devised a diabolical plot to get rid of him. So Daniel had to make another choice. Was he going to pray to King Darius and worship him? Or was he going to remain faithful to God? What did Daniel choose? In Daniel 6, verse 10, it says, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room, with its windows open towards Jerusalem. What does it say he did? He prayed three times a day, just as he had done, always done. What did he do? He gave thanks, giving thanks to God. Daniel made a choice, again, to follow God, to be faithful to God, to be found obedient. You know the rest of the story. He was rescued from the lions then. I, I do kind of find it interesting that in all these stories, I never read about Daniel or Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego uh, wringing their hands or being anxious or doubtful or fearful. Do you read anywhere in these stories that they were fearful? In fact, they were bold. They were courageous. They stepped out in faith. And in the fiery furnace story, the three friends said, God can save us, but if he doesn't, that's okay too. They weren't wringing their hands. They weren't scared to death about what man could do to them. Again, a very corrupt, a very pagan culture. Things around them were spinning out of control, but yet they remained 
secure in the Lord, in his faithful hand, they knew that God had a plan for their lives. Through each adversity and each test, in an environment that was hostile towards God and his people, Daniel and his friends remained faithful. They were resolute. They were strong. They were courageous. They were bold. And God blessed them and raised them to positions of prominence. So it, it does make me wonder and beg the question, at least for me, is that how was, how was Daniel able to navigate through all that? I mean, how did he, how could he be and his friends be so strong and so resolute and so bold in a culture that pressed on them all the time? Nothing seemed to be going right. Everything seemed to be against God and what they believed in. This wasn't their choice to just pick up and move to Babylon. That in and of itself was traumatic enough. They had to go. They had no choice. They were a defeated people. They were a captive people. Well, there's several things I'll mention briefly that I feel like were keys to kind of how Daniel lived his life that, were, that made him the person that he was. First of all, I believe that Daniel recognized the sovereignty of God in his life and beyond his life in history, what all was going on at that time. Daniel believed in God's sovereignty. He was anchored in that. Daniel believed that everything that God had, that God had everything in control and that he was orchestrating all the events in the world around him to accomplish his purposes and declare his glory. So when we look at the circumstances today and everything happening in our world, do we, are we anchored in the sovereignty of God? That this world isn't spinning out of control God's just kind of up there not sure what to do. God's in it. He's got a plan for it. He's going to accomplish his purpose in this country, in this culture, and in the world. And one day, he's coming back as a, at the end of history. So Daniel had that belief. Here's a definition that I use for sovereignty of God. I believe that Daniel believed, or that we believe, that nothing can happen to us that God does not allow for our good and his glory. Second, Daniel, and I've mentioned this word several times, he remained faithful. He was faithful. Daniel didn't try to compromise or find workarounds, did he? He didn't compromise. He stayed true to the word of God. He was like a rock. He was steadfast. He never wavered in his commitment to God. In spite of all the distractions, in spite of all the threats, threats that surrounded him, to me, Daniel didn't just speak his faith. He lived his faith. He moved in his faith. He took action in his faith. He didn't just say the words, but he lived the action that demonstrated his faith, his commitment to God, and his belief that God was sovereign over every circumstance that happened in his life. Working out that which was for the good for Daniel and ultimately for God's glory. Third, Daniel was obedient. Think about the food there in chapter 1. Daniel obeyed God in his word. He was obedient to God's commands. And he was obedient to the call of God on his life at that time that he lived in a foreign land. He was obedient. So he believed in the sovereignty of God. 
He was obedient. He was faithful. The fourth thing I'll mention was Daniel. I, I don't see anywhere in here where Daniel lashed out at his enemies. I believe Daniel loved his, his enemies, even his enemies. He was loving. He was kind. He didn't uh, resist, at least that I can see. He didn't show anger. He didn't show hostility or animosity, even to the ones who were trying to kill him in that plot that they devised to get rid of him. I, I just don't see that in Daniel. He was, he loved his enemies. He was kind to his enemies. The fifth thing that I'll mention, the last thing about Daniel that I've always admired, that one verse that I read where when Daniel found out that, you know, he had a choice to make about either worshiping the king and the image that was put for the king or staying faithful to God and true to God, what did he do? He went to his house and he kneeled and he prayed. And the scripture says, that verse we read says that he had been doing that, always had always done that, three times a day, three times a day. He was steadfast, he was consistent, he was persistent in his prayers, okay? He, he was a prayer warrior. Prayer, I believe, changes either us Sometimes God uses it to change our circumstances. Prayer still works. Prayer changes things. The, and the part of that verse that where Daniel, I loved about Daniel, he said, it said, he always gave thanks. So here he's going to pray. He's finding out that his life is going to end but he's giving thanks. <laughs> what a testimony. What an example for us, I believe, on how we can live our life in a culture, in a society, in a nation that has gone haywire in many ways. We can still follow the example of Daniel in all these ways. As a nation, God does not owe us deliverance. God doesn't owe us deliverance. In our pride, arrogance, materialism, sin, depravity, we do not have special favor with him. No matter how many times we want to, people want to say, God bless America, we have no special favor with him if we're not obedient to him. Now, I love God bless America. And I think some say that and genuinely mean that. But God will only bless us when we're obedient, faithful, when we turn to him. We have no special favor with him. Increasingly, as the storm clouds appear to be gathering so quickly in our world and in our nation, I see two things happening. One is people from all walks of life feel helpless and anxious, especially for their families, their children, their grandchildren. So people are beginning to feel helpless and anxious. And the second thing is, because of our pride as a fallen people, we see the masses of people continue to look to the government, to look to our political leader, to look to our military, even to look to themselves to find the answer on how to solve the problems. Instead of looking up, we're looking out or within. And that cannot help us. That cannot help us. 
Let me just caution all of us here as Christians that even as a believer, if we're not careful, it's easy for us to live in a state of anxiety and fear sometimes. Sometimes we might even despair about the future. And if we're not careful, we can forget our security that we have in Christ. Our security is not in this world or the things of this world, but in Christ, in Christ alone. And sometimes we lose our eternal perspective. We're so focused on the things of the world. I'm guilty of that. I assume that maybe some of you are guilty of that at times. Let's don't lose that perspective. But one thing's for sure, whether it be as a nation or on, on a personal basis, we will never see any deliverance unless and until we humble ourselves and cry out to God for his grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But it be, needs to begin on a personal level, to place one's faith in Christ, in Jesus, to begin a personal relationship with him. And until you do that, I can assure you there will be no peace. There will be no real joy. You'll continue to have doubts and fears and anxieties in your life and about the future. There's a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and I'm kind of closing down here, but if you'll turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, a verse, a couple of verses that I think you're familiar with, verses 14 and 15, God says in these verses, and I really believe this is so appropriate for what we are living in today and the environment we're in, and as we look around us as a nation, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them, forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God gives us three messages there, I believe, in how we as Christians can respond to our environment, to our culture, to what we see happening. First of all, he says to humble ourselves and pray. Humility and prayer. Secondly, he says to seek him. Do we have a longing for God each day? And then thirdly, he says, turn. Repent, confess, repent, turn to him. I love what he says in verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. So when that happened, what does God say? He will hear. He will be attentive. He will listen. He will see the prayers and hear the prayers of his people. I wonder what would happen if individually and corporately we humbled ourselves, confessing our total dependence on God, acknowledging that, acknowledging that no matter how smart we think we are, we do not have the answers nor the power to do anything on our own. I wonder what would happen if we started with ourselves Acknowledging every day that to God. Praying on behalf of our nation as well. I wonder what would happen if believers and churches all over this country fasted and prayed and acknowledged that God alone is the only source of help for help and hope that we have as a nation. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if we as his people would turn away from the things of the world day by day that distract us and prevent us from keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus and understanding that only then can we have true peace and joy in our lives. If we practice that, if we, I wonder what would happen if we did these things. I'm going to close if you will turn to Psalm 33, I think it, again, this passage in Psalm 33 
as we've talked about our culture, our nation, our individual lives, I think it's appropriate for us to read the last half of this psalm that, that really says, speaks to the nation, the country, but us as individuals as well. Starting in verse 12, I'm going to read through the rest of the chapter. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by the, his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who what? Fear him. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Where is your hope today? To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait we wait in hope for the Lord. We wait. We're patient. In these days of turmoil, in these days of trouble, we wait patiently on the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord even as we put our hope in you. What a great song. What a great message. What a great encouragement that our hope is not in this world. It's not in military. It's not in might. It's not in political leaders. It's not in the government. Our hope, our only hope in this world is Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord, if you know him as your Savior, and Lord of your life, then he can be that rock in your life, that hope in your life. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be anxious about what's happening all around you in this world, in this country today. Our hope is in Christ, in him alone. And God one day will bring it all to a close. We need not fear. We need to look forward to his coming. And he will take us out of what is a difficult, difficult environment that we live in. And folks, it may get worse. It may get worse. But I hope that Daniel's life will be an encouragement to you in the way he lived in a very difficult environment. And the whole culture in which he lived was against him against everything that he stood for. But Daniel and his friends stayed firm. They stood firm. They didn't compromise. And they, in the midst of all that, what? They were a witness to the kings in which they were under. They were a witness of God's goodness, of God's love, of God's sovereignty. May we be that way in this time that we live, which can be difficult at times. So I don't know if we have any music. Yeah, come, come on up, Caroline. And so as Caroline is coming and, and Ethan, um, I just want to just pause and just ask you this morning um, to kind of look inside yourself. Are you anxious about the future? I, I can't answer that for you. I hope that you're not, if you know Christ, if you know Jesus. But you sometimes the feeling of doubts and fears may creep in. 
Maybe you're experiencing hardships today and difficulties, and you're trying to figure out what to do about it, how to handle it. But in, deep down in your life, you know you can't really do it on your own, in your own strength. Perhaps someone today is dealing with a crisis of faith in your life or that you struggle to remain faithful. Daniel was faithful. He was obedient. But maybe you have found yourself not being faithful and obedient to what God's called you to do. Or maybe your prayer life is in shambles. Maybe you've become cynical and short, a loving towards other people. Daniel was loving. He was kind. He was a prayer warrior. Or perhaps someone here this morning has never trusted Christ as Savior, never developed or begun a personal relationship with God. God invites you today to look inside your heart and to invite him in, to invite Jesus in, the one who died on the cross for you, the only one that can bring forgiveness acceptance of the Father and salvation, the only one who can really bring you peace and joy in the midst of the turmoil. On a personal level and in the world we live in, only Christ can bring that peace and real joy to your life. So I would invite you to stand uh, as Caroline and Ethan leave us. If there's a decision that you would like to make, I'll be here. If there's a decision that you would like to make, there at your seat. Uh, just think about some of the things, perhaps some of something today, God's using, the Holy Spirit's using to convict in your life and to, to bring you to the place of asking God for his help and his power to be at work in your life. So, Thank you for being here today. Um, we are dismissed, but before we are, let me let me lead us in a word of prayer as we go. Father, thank you for this uh, day that you've given us to come and to worship you, to study your word, to to study the life of one of your servants, Daniel. And the application of Daniel's life to our lives is so real today, Father. It's so, so important, so applicable to the world we live in, Father. Help us to be found faithful to you, Father. Help us to be found a prayer warrior, to be obedient to your word, to love others. And Father, each day, to recognize your sovereignty at work in our lives, that we might accomplish your purpose and plan for us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for those are, who are here today, Father. I pray that you would speak into our lives, that you would go with us now as we return home. I pray that you would just keep us safe, Father, on the road as we travel home here in just a few minutes, Lord. Father, we do love you. We do praise you today. We thank you uh, for your goodness to us, for Jesus, for your gift of eternal life and salvation through your Son. Father, go with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.